of who are watching right there. Our guest minister this morning doesn't need an introduction. I said something to my wife, and I'm saying this publicly for the first time. Out of all ministers that I know in this country, that I relate to it, the one who has reached out to me the most in terms of supporting me is Pastor Godman, and that's the truth. Um, 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 you know, there are, there are some things we need to say, just like Pastor God you said, we might not say them every time, but truth be told, and, and it's not just me again, Pastor Godman has been a succor of so many, like Paul said, and myself also, always watching out. We were once neighbors, and I remember when he visited me at home, I was shocked that day. I said, knock on my door, and lo and behold, was Pastor Godman, ever so humble, so resourceful. I mean, if you know, we know what God is doing in his life, and yet he's still himself. Humble, and he's a role model to ministers. He's carried himself well over the years, and, and, and we just celebrate and thank God for him. With Jesus' joy this morning, shall we welcome the senior pastor of the Elevation Church, my brother, Pastor Godman Akilabi. Thank you very much. Praise God, praise God, praise God. All right, for everyone right here in the studio and everyone joining us from wherever you are, whether you're in the car, you are home, you are, you know, you, are, you, are, you may even be at work, uh, maybe you're watching over someone in the hospital, wherever you may be right now, my prayer is that the grace of God will be with you, and I wanted to take distractions away from you. Uh, Pastor Dilly has set me up this morning, you know, just, 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 to, just to just go on a blast, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, we're preparing for the exponential conference, which starts on Monday, Monday and Tuesday. So when he called me, I said, oh, this is just the weekend before exponential, but I'm going to come uh, because uh, this puts me in the mood <laughs> for, for exponential. Uh, so for, for everyone joining, like Pastor Daly said, please share, share, share this link, uh, call your friends, let them get in. This is, uh, uh, this is a moving train and it's moving us in the right direction. And you need to be a part of this right now. Uh, will you join me as we say a word of prayer? Our Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, to rub minds together this morning. Your word says, iron sharpens iron, and the brother sharpens the countenance of his friend. Lord, make me uh, that iron that will sharpen iron this, 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 this day. We thank you uh, for the opportunity of the M3 Summit. We thank you for what you're doing in the life of your son and your daughter uh, right here. And we thank you for all the supporting ministers, everyone in the studio, and everyone joining us from far and near. Lord, we thank you for uh, what you are proposed to do with our time together. Holy Spirit will give you the permission to just move over this gathering virtually, wherever people are right now. Let your presence touch everyone. Charge your word with power. Let it minister grace to every hearer, and let no one be the same again. Raise new ministries. Uh, let churches that are dying come to life. Everyone in the valley of decision. Let your light shine upon their path this morning, and let your, 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 your spirit fill us up afresh in the precious name of Jesus. Can I hear you better? Amen. Amen. Oh, come on. Somebody in the studio, put your hands together. Celebrate Jesus. Uh, 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 you, you can have your seat. And if you're joining, I mean, all the people joining us virtually, uh, please just, just give me some virtual clap also. You can, just, you can just put it in the chat there, just some virtual clap. All right. It's really good to, to, to be here this morning. Pastor Maureen, you're looking very good. Yeah. I was, <laughs> It's, re it's really good to be here this, this morning, like I said, and I don't take for granted the opportunity uh, to be a blessing uh, at, at this summit. And for all the ministers in the house and all the friends of the house, uh, I want to welcome you very specially. Uh, for those of us joining you know, virtually, uh, the, the studio is a bit dark, so I can't really see the people in here. <laughs> all right, so l l let's get into it. Uh, I will start out this morning by just saying one or two things. First, about just like Pastor Dilly did, some one or two experiences with COVID, then I'm going to get into 
my talk, when I asked Pastor David, what should, you, what should I share about? He said, this is about capacity development. I should just flow. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking on, um, on a, a, my title is a prayer. Let me just put it that way. Yeah, my title is a prayer. And it's a prayer that I pray a lot. And I, 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 and I pray very often because it has yielded uh, the answers that come for that prayer has transformed my life. All right? But before I get into it, I want to say, uh, like Pastor Dele said, that one of the greatest blessings of COVID is, for me, the understanding that there's a part of our assignment that we cannot fulfill except we have a mind shift. And as the way COVID came in, you know, in all its, uh, you know, quote and unquote, wickedness and, and all that, but there's a, a good side to it, which we believe that if we're looking for a reason why God will permit a plague upon our world today, uh, you know, Romans 8 and 28 says, for we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose, and it's not all good things, all good things bad and the ugly. Everything is working together because our God is extremely intentional. Yeah. yeah. So God is intentional about COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I discovered, I'm just going to share two and I'll go into my message, is that COVID perhaps has come to move the church from aggregation to penetration. How do I mean? The church as we know it, it's, it's about a gathering. It has always been about a gathering. People have to gather together. And you see, the, 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 the reaction, <laughs> uh, the violent reaction of some ministers to our inability to gather uh, speaks to the love for the kingdom. But you see, that love for the kingdom can also be misappropriated. Yeah. Uh, because it also speaks to an enduring tradition and, you know, we reference the fact that the Bible says we should not forsake the gathering of one another. Uh, but in the days that that scripture was written, gathering was limited to physical gathering. There was nothing like virtual gathering. If Apostle Paul was li living today, what he would do with virtual gathering, you can't think about it. Yeah. What, what he would do with technology. Because they maximize the technology of their days. I mean, this guy went on all kinds of boats. These were the days they didn't have the, the motorized boat uh, and ship and all that. But whatever was available, anything for Jesus, he would do it. So you can imagine that kind of a person having the capacity, I mean, opportunity to leverage what we have today. It, it, it's not going to be like what we're experiencing, I'm telling you, because our capacity to pivot, like they use the word in, in the business world, our capacity to pivot and look for every available opportunity to represent Christ and to push the frontiers of the kingdom is being limited uh, by our inability, you know, to just to let go of certain traditions. And I'm not saying that to mean that uh, we're not going to, aggregation is not going to be strong again. No. But as we get stronger in aggregation, COVID has come to, you know, just point us to the opportunities that we have lost in penetration. Because this M3 Summit is a testimony to that. As they were saying, thousands of people joined yesterday. Yeah, this place, this studio cannot take thousands of people if we're going to limit it to physical gathering only. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of my friends, I do a lot of things online. A lot of my friends, people do with prayer ministries who, who gather thousands of people every morning to pray. Yeah, a couple of my friends have that. And, you know, before COVID, they, they, they had that ministry. <laughs> it was just that it was limited to whatever they, they, I mean, we could do in gatherings. So, ladies and gentlemen, every minister, please hear me out. You need to ask God and tell him, ask him, what is my place in the oncoming, unusual penetration of the gospel through digital technology? What will be my own place? Pastor David was sharing about the, the course, you know, the courses he has developed and all that. I've, I've developed courses on, on especially, I mean, I, I've done a lot with relationship. I'm launching next week uh, the Amari course. Uh, Amari is love in Latin. 
the marriage course uh, for you know premarital, uh, marriage preparatory, and uh, marriage enrichment. You know, I've done all that, and that is going to be there. You know, for people from all over the world to enjoy. Before now, I just did my Mr. and Mrs. Better have knowing that you know, I have this relationship ministry. I'll just be the, the the church does not allow me to go full blast. Yeah, because I'm so vested in the local church. But with technology, I can do a lot more in that aspect too. And many things that are just legacy driven. Yeah. So if you're a minister listening to me, uh, you may even have a business on the side. This is the time for you to think through how you are going to leverage digital technology for the fulfillment of ministry, for touching lives in unusual dimension. Very, very important. When Jesus said, go to the ends of the heart, he didn't mean that we have to go physically. Yeah. What we thought was that we would have to go physically. Yeah. But technology is borderless. One, one of the characteristics of technology is that it's borderless. So when you gain something, get something that is borderless, that, that, that fits the description of the, the, of the great commandment or the great commission, sorry. Yeah. It fits that description more than anything that we've ever seen before. Yeah. And we must not you know, shy away from, 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 from maximizing it. Yeah, we, we, we must not shy away from maximizing it. We must do all that is possible with it. Uh, and for me, that's one of the... Uh, the, the, the uh, another thing that I, I'll say about um, COVID is that, uh, it, which is related to this too, is that it's, it helps us to see that what you have in the corner of where you are is needed all over the place. Yeah. Because these are the days you just throw something online and before you blink, thousands of people, by the next day, tens of thousands. Before you know it, hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Because many of us, you know, these are the days where you just need to wake up in the morning and you finish your personal devotion and one word is burning in your spirit. Just record it. <laughs> yeah. Just put your video and just record it. And just post it. You know, most believers feel like you know, before now a lot of the things that are happening right now you know, literally speaking what is happening right now is everyone has a microphone yeah, yeah. everyone everyone can broadcast yeah, everyone has a station yeah. it's unprecedented truly speaking, it's unprecedented it's like Everyone can get a camera and just literally somebody's following you all over the place yeah. and everybody in the world can see what you are doing. Yeah. What a way to push the, the Christ-like nature to the world. Because if what I'm doing is Christ-like, I should not cover it. It's to shine my light so that the world can see it. Yeah. <laughs> so if you are still shy about social media, yeah. you are the one I'm speaking to pastor that is still shy about social media. You are the one I'm speaking to. Yeah. You are the one I'm speaking to. Uh, let, me, let me stop on this. Which is that if they did not keep a good record, we will not have the Bible. Look at the book of Acts of the Apostles. And how they just, you know, the apostles went to this place. They left at Iconia. They went to Laodicea. They went to... And they were giving us what happened when Paul got to this place, when Peter got to the house of Colinius. Yeah, what happened and all that. You know, it took a lot. The limited technology of the day, from memory to long writing, for us to get all these things. Now we now have what can capture effortlessly. <laughs> effortlessly. And then we're looking away from it, forgetting that 50 years from today, Depending on your age, God will satisfy you with long life, but you're not going to live forever. Okay, let me even stretch it. 100 years from today, you will not be here. And if Jesus has not come, your life should be worthy of, you know, recording and for people to be able to read what has happened. Because it will get to a point. Paul will be too far from some people. They need you. <laughs> You know, most of the cities that were mentioned in the Bible are no longer called those same names. They're no longer available. Yeah. So, the chronicles of Lagos ministers 
will probably be more <laughs> will probably be more applicable in 50 years time because maybe Lagos will still be Lagos. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Archaeologists have to dig and find to say, okay, so where is Iconium? Where is Laodicea? You know, where is Philippi? <laughs> because all those places are not called those names again. Many of those places, the, the names have changed. All right. So, praise God. Let's, let's get on. In the time that I have, I'm going to be speaking to the subject that are titled, Give me capacity for my opportunities. Give me capacity for my opportunities. And this is a prayer, like I said. A prayer that I pray. And a prayer that I want to leave for everyone uh, join to the entry summit today, every minister on this platform. One of the greatest prayers that you can ever pray for the sake of living a fulfilled life, for the sake of fulfilling your destiny, and for the sake of fulfilling the mandate of God upon your life is to pray, Lord, give me capacity for my opportunities. Yeah, give me capacity for my opportunities. That's one of the greatest prayers that a minister can pray. Because when it comes to the kingdom, <laughs> God creates and masterminds opportunities. Perhaps the issue that we have is that we have many ministers who don't have capacity for the opportunities that God is bringing. Are you still with me today? Very, very important. Very important. If I can say it this way, a good question to ask is, how strong is your strength? Proverbs 24 and verse number 10. Message translation. He said, if you fall to pieces in a crisis, there wasn't much to you in the first place. That's Proverbs 24 and verse number 10. Message translation. I'll read it one more time. If you fall to pieces in crisis, there wasn't much to you in the first place. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been to a bit of crisis the last one year. Our index case, for instance, in Lagos, Nigeria, happened about this time last year. And I remember uh, getting into uh, uh, preparation for uh, 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 exponential conference. I had a guest, my friend, uh, Dr. Conway Edwards from Plano, Texas, who called me and was like, God, man, why not, why not show we're going to be able to come? She was, he was supposed to come with his wife, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, my church board, they're making trouble about, now they said you have an index case in, in Nigeria. And I was like, oh, Dr. Conway, come off it. He's just one person. One Italian guy got into Nigeria. They've quarantined him. Uh, this thing, you know, we mastered Ebola. So this thing, uh, you know, it doesn't disturb you flying to Nigeria. What's the meaning of all this? And I'm sure the guy will be okay in two weeks. And that will be the end of COVID in Nigeria. Exactly that, what I told him. I didn't know I was talking out of ignorance. Yeah, I was sincerely wrong. <laughs> I just thought about it, you know. I put my mind on how the Ebola virus was isolated, that uh, George Sawyer was the name of the guy from Liberia, uh, first consultant in the Koei. That was where I had uh, my, my, my two girls. So I, I'm familiar with that hospital. In fact, Dr. Adadevo, the woman that died, I knew her personally uh, because I had my two girls in that hospital, you know. Uh, so I was like, look, that was how we handled it. And then we separated, as in I played everything in my mind. If you ask me, my faith then was saying that COVID would not last more than one month. Uh, we dealt with Ebola. It's not Nigeria. Uh, and with God on our side. <laughs> so I, I jacked my friend up and I said, you know, just, just, just come. Just come. And, uh, uh, but I didn't know that we're getting into something that will rock us so much that it's going to be a crisis. We, 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 <laughs> we finished uh, the exponential conference and then I was speaking at a, at a conference in Dubai and I told my wife, come along so we'll rest after all this and then I'll do my meetings and then we, we were, we were just planning like nothing was happening. We said, well, so from Dubai we'll go to Singapore because I'd always wanted to visit Joseph Prince's church and oh, I told them, send them an email. My peer was communicating, let's get somebody. I, I want to see that facility. I want to see that. You know, I was planning as if nothing was going on. 
By the time we got to Dubai, they told us that after your one week here, if you want to proceed to Singapore, by the time you are coming back, we'll quarantine you. In fact, Nigeria had already listed Singapore as one of the countries that where you are, if you're coming from there, you may not even be able to enter again. We just cancel that part of the trip. Yeah. I'm not telling you how the crisis escalated. By the time we got back to Lagos, the story has started changing. This was March last year. The story has started changing. We got back to Lagos, and within, I think, is it one week or two weeks that we got back to Lagos, there was a lockdown. And I remember sitting in my office and saying, ah, Jesus, you mean we are not going to meet next Sunday? <laughs> This is not good, though. <laughs> As in, and this was me that we even stream normally. And then I think about people who are not even used to, you know, or streaming, you know, and all that, and how that, all that. And you see, when a crisis comes, it comes to test the metal of your strength. Yeah, uh, it, it, that's what it's coming for. Uh, that's why the Bible says, if you feel in the day of adversity, it means that your strength is small. New Century Version says, if you give up, when trouble comes, it shows that you are weak. NIV says, if you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? And New King James Version says, if you fail in a day of adversity, said your strength is small. Your strength is small. Your strength is small. So it's important that we understand that God creates opportunities. And there are opportunities in crisis, just like we have been saying in the preamble. There are opportunities in crisis. And it is the strength that I've developed and the capacity that I've developed that will show whether I will be able to lay hold on those opportunities very well. Somebody say, give me capacity for my opportunities. That's, that's a strong prayer that somebody has to pray because there are serious opportunities ahead of us in this generation, even with what is happening right now. All kinds of opportunities opening up, especially for ministry around the world, different areas of ministry. You know, for instance, now we realize that kids is now becoming a normal thing for kids to go to school from home. And so even parents are getting more comfortable with kids even learning the Bible at home. And that's a huge opportunity for people with children's ministry. What are you going to do about that? Yeah. We're creating content for adults. Who's going to create the children's content? Do you get what I'm talking about? There are all kinds of opportunities that are just coming up. All, all kinds of opportunities. And uh, the main question is, do you have capacity for all these opportunities as a minister? In the different areas that opportunities will show up, they said, as we go, and based on uh, prophecies, based on uh, 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 even what Jesus told us, this may not be the last pandemic in a short time. The forecast is that pandemics may happen much more frequently. The last pandemic was 100 years ago. Yeah, the pandemics, you know, people could have lived a whole lifetime and not experienced a pandemic. The people who experienced the last pandemic is just... You know, you can count the number of people that are still alive who experienced that on, on the fingertip. That means there are many people who lived and never experienced one. It then means that as we move closer to the end times, people may experience one, two, or three pandemics in their lifetime. And it's going to change, you know, the social strata, social connection, and all kinds of things are going to change and continue to change. But you see, in the midst of that, the Bible says that in the midst of darkness, our God will give us light. And that light is illumination. And we then have the opportunity to shine our light as part of the body of Christ, and that's how we become solution providers. That's who we are. But what I'm sharing today is that you need to take responsibility for capacity development to be able to, you know, take your place in the opportunities that will present itself. People have gone through crisis in the Bible. I'll, I'll mention two and move on. David went through, or Israel went through a crisis, and the crisis was the Philistines attacking them. 
and he became persistent and consistent. At some point, Saul had to go out with all the army, all the men who are fighting age, including David's brothers. And then that was David's opportunity in 1 Samuel 17 at the Valley of Elah. And David showed up that morning. If you told him that he was going to encounter, uh, you know, a destiny opportunity, he would say no because his assignment was uh, Uber food. Yeah, he was just supposed to deliver food. That was all. Yeah. His father said, go and deliver food to your brothers and their captain too so that you won't put them in the line of fire. Give him some egunje, you know, bribe, you know, some, 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 some food also. That was all. That was his assignment. And if he failed that assignment, it would be that either he didn't deliver his brother's food or he didn't give their captain food or he had the captain's food and gave his brother food. Yeah, because there was no email or phone call or WhatsApp. So the captains were not expecting anything. So you will say he failed. But he did that, and then there was something extra. There was something extra. Something that just showed up out of the blues. And it was an opportunity that God had created. Yeah. And when they asked David, you know what I love the most about, and that's the only place I'm going to read, uh, verse 34 uh, uh, down to 37 of 1 Samuel 17. When they asked David, when they asked David, why do you think that you can confront this Goliath. Yeah. Because somebody is, is listening to me right now. Somebody is going to ask you, why do you think you should start this new ministry? Why do you think God is calling you to Europe? Or why do you think God is asking you to start this mission outfit? Why do you think, why do you think you should do this or do that? Why do you think you should move to Lagos? Why do you think you should go to Abuja? Why do you, that, 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 people will ask you a question. Yeah. Why do you think you should start this relationship ministry? Why? Why do you want to start a prayer ministry? Who told you you are a prophet? <laughs> people will ask you all kinds of questions. When they ask David that question, in 1 Samuel 17, when you read from verse 4, the, uh, 34, the Bible says, but David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I cut it by the beard and struck it and killed it. David was reeling out his portfolio you know, if it was a, a, a show guy or they, they call it show reel <laughs> in cinematography, he, he was just reeling out, you know, this is what I've done, this is, this is my CV, literally speaking. Yeah. And all David was saying is, King, I respect you, but I need to let you know I have capacity. Yeah. I need to let you know. I don't apologize for my capacity. Yeah. I don't apologize for my capacity. Yeah. I built it. I built this capacity. Yeah, I tried some things before and I didn't fail. I tried some things before and I can testify that grace works. That's what David was saying here. Yeah, I tried some things before and I can, I can testify. Can I speak to a minister who has been a little despondent, who has lost team this season, who, who's lost a bit of encouragement? Can I tell you that you need to look back into what God has done through you in time past? Because it suggests that God can do much more than you can ever think or imagine even in the years ahead. And that's why you must not allow your faith to capitulate this time. That's why you must not allow your faith to be strangled. That's why your vision, uh, you cannot afford to allow your vision to leak out completely. Because when that happens, you lose the power of aspiration. Are you still with me today? Very, very important. The servant has killed both the lion and the bear, David said. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will also deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And so I said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. <laughs> you know that's the way you present your case. Then you just say, you, we wish you were. <laughs> we wish you were. Yeah. You, you say you want to start a business? We wish you were. We wish you were. Yeah. We wish you were. When people start to tell you we wish you were, 
it means that you have marshaled your point by the help of the Holy Ghost to the point that they know that, look, uh, let's, just, let's just allow him. Let's allow him. Let's allow him. Joseph had the same encounter uh, uh, in, in the prison where an opportunity presented itself and if you have not developed capacity, what will happen at that point is that you, you, you chicken out. Yeah, you cave in. You cave in. And you know Proverbs 24 and verse 10 said, I love one translation, I'm trying to remember the translation. It says, if you fail to perform under pressure, you are a poor specimen. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're a poor specimen. And all of us are specimens. Uh, that's what we saw in the all of, all of fame of, for faith in Hebrews 11. We saw specimens tested. You know, I, I studied engineering my first degree, so I understand specimen. Yeah. When you talk about strength of materials, one of the courses I took in my 300 level or so in engineering school, well, that materials are made from different, I mean, different substances. So that's why glass is different from metal and then it's different from plastic. They have different strength level and they are used for different things. But in the place of their application, their strength or capacity must correspond. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. So there are brittle, seemingly brittle materials, but that will be transparent or translucent because they'll be used for that purpose. But when you talk about steel and iron, they are usually opaque, but they, they can carry load. <laughs> are you still with me today? Very, very important. And the Bible says in the great house there are many vessels. Yeah. Many vessels with different capacities and capabilities. And we must make sure that we're being used as vessels unto honor. Joseph uh, told the guys there uh, in, in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 40. The Bible says, and Joseph came to them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. Pharaoh's butler and the baker. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house, saying, why did you, uh, why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, we each have had a dream, and there's no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, do not interpretation belong to God? Tell them to me, please. You know, it, <laughs> uh, it takes capacity for you to say, bring it on. Yeah. Because it's an opportunity in disguise. This was the only way that Joseph would be able to leave the prison. At least the only window that was open. He did not know that that was his window to leave the prison. But that was the window. Yeah. Many people have global ministries. You know, high scale in terms of calling. But they remain in obscurity because they allow opportunities to pass anyhow. I mean, look at, uh, Pastor D, look at the kind of calling upon Joseph. <laughs> heavy. Heavy administrative calling. Heavy apostolic calling on Joseph. But at this time, he was in the prison. If you saw him that time, you wouldn't think there's anything, any big deal about him. No great shake, you know. Nothing serious. He was just one nice guy who had a leadership skill and was just organizing people. That's all. But nobody knew that this guy is still going to be the one to organize the whole of Egypt. And this was his opportunity just to interpret the dream. He had developed capacity for interpretation of dream. So when this came, he did not say, I can't help you. He said, bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on. He said, bring it on. So, I'm going to talk about, quickly, four truths about opportunities. Four truths about opportunities. And then I'm going to talk also about uh, another four truths after now. <laughs> so, four truths. Let's start with four truths about opportunities. It's important to know that opportunity is a combination of circumstances favorable for a purpose. By the way, when we talk about opportunities, it's a combination of circumstances favorable for a purpose. You know, uh, the preacher in Ecclesiastes said uh, 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 that the, the race is not to the swift, the battle is not to the strong, men of uh, understanding, you know, will not always win and all that, but he said time and chance happen to them all. 
been at the right place at the right time. A combination of circumstances favorable for a purpose. Now, that, that are very quickly, four things that I, 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 want, I want us to understand about opportunities. One is that there are no people without opportunities. We only have people who cannot recognize and seize opportunities. Yeah. So for all the ministers joining us today, I needed to understand one thing. One thing that I've lived my life by is that I, I always trust God through the help of the Holy Spirit to help me uh, to, 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 uh, you know, to see opportunities, to help me to see opportunities. That, that I said there are no people without opportunities. We only have people who cannot recognize opportunities. We only have people who cannot recognize oppor opportunities. Uh, uh, and, you know, so, uh, when you read stories in the Bible, you even understand that opportunity presents itself to the last moment of our lives. Look at Luke, uh, Luke, Luke 23. Jesus was hanging between two condemned, uh, 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 yeah, how do I put it now? Two people who have been condemned, right? Uh, was it, one was a thief? The other one was a, both of them, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Two thieves, one on the right and one on the left. I mean, when they sentenced them to death by crucifixion and all that, and they left them there, what do you think? A religious person would have thought that these two people have been condemned to death and to hell. They, they, they ran out of opportunities completely. Nothing can ever happen in their life again. But to show that until your last breath, If you can recognize opportunities, and that takes me, you know, uh, even to the next truth, which is opportunities don't just come once, they keep coming. Life itself is a bundle of opportunities. So until my last breath, I'm supposed to be expecting an opportunity to be a blessing, opportunity to do ministry in a different scale, in a different scope. Opportunity to touch lives in a different scope. In Luke 23, when you read verse 42 and 43, the conversation that Jesus had with the seemingly sinner guy, one of the thief, you know, because one was saying, oh, you call yourself a Messiah, see, Messiah on the cross, e -e -e -e. you know, that one sounded like a Nigerian, especially, so, <laughs> especially all those guys on Twitter or social media generally, <laughs> they start, always start, because they, they can drag anybody, the guy was trying to drag Jesus, yeah, he was trying to drag Jesus, <laughs> He said, hey, 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 ah, Messiah, Messiah, see yourself on the cross. No, 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 no. Ah, and the other guy said, hey, this man's a righteous man. He's not like us. Invariably, this guy recognized that he was a sinner yes. and that this is the Messiah. Yes. And he said, when you get to your, on your throne, don't forget me. He obviously repented and all that. Jesus said, today, yes. you'll be with me in paradise. Today. At the last minute of their breath, somebody still recognizes opportunity while somebody is still living in denial and disdain of the truth. Last minute. Last minute. Jesus said, today, today, today. Surely I say to you, verse 43 of Luke 23, today you will be with me in paradise. Today. <laughs> People wrote off this guy completely. He was condemned to die. There are people in ministry right now. People just think that nothing will come out of you again. You've tried. You've planted three churches. All of them did not try. You know all those kind of things. People are taught, look, uh, you said you were a missionary. You tried. You went to the north. Nothing came. You went to Togo. They sent you back home. And then, what, what else? All kinds of things that happen to people in ministry. But if you understand that the Bible says, faithful is he that has called you and he will also do it. Then you keep your eyes on the opportunities that God will bring. And you keep praying the prayer. Give me capacity for my opportunities. Glory be to Jesus. Very important. Very important. Very important. So opportunities don't just, don't, don't come just once. They keep coming. Life itself is a bundle of opportunity. Number three is that let me put it this way. And this is a very common. We hear it all the time. That success happens when opportunity meets preparation. Another way to put it is that potent luck portion. Because sometimes you are speaking to business people and our language is different. Some of them believe in luck. 
I said, if you believe in luck at all, when I speak to business, I said, if you believe in luck at all, potent luck portion, when you say, what is the, like we say, love portion. Yeah, if you want luck portion, the potent luck portion, <laughs> potent luck portions are predictable. They, they are made by mixing preparation with opportunity. Anytime you see preparation and opportunity mixed together, somebody's going to get lucky that day. Yeah, that's what it means. Somebody's going to get lucky that day. Yeah. I don't believe in luck. I believe that the steps of a good man are ordered by God. <laughs> I believe my steps are ordered. But when God is ordering my steps, the responsibility that I have is to come with capacity. Yeah. Heaven does not delight in ordering the steps of a saint that lacks capacity to maximize the opportunity that heaven is bringing. So to all the ministers with us today, I need you to understand God is counting on you to develop your, yourself, to develop your capacity. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about four places where you need to develop capacity. But before I, I do that, I'll take the last one on opportunity, which is you must be positioned for your opportunities. Yeah. You must be positioned for your opportunities. You must be positioned for your opportunities. There's something about positioning, ladies and gentlemen. And when I, when, when I started to talk about the places to, 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 uh, to build capacity as a minister, you, you will understand what I'm saying better. Positioning is very important. Positioning is very important. Positioning is very important. That is why, you know, we, we, apples don't grow in Nigeria or in Lagos. Yeah. If you're an apple and you're in Lagos, destiny fulfillment will be far. Yeah. Fulfilling of calling will be so far. Yeah. That's, that's how it is. That is also the reason why Agbalumo does not grow in Florida. I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. If you, if you, I, what is the, what's, what's English for Agbalumo? Agbalumo. Huh? Cherry. Okay. African cherry. Yes. They call it African cherry. Yeah. African cherry. Yeah. Is it, they call it African cherry. They localize the destiny of the of the thing. Say so this is, <laughs> yeah. And the truth is that God is the one that positions you and I. Yeah. God is the one that positions us. When you read the story of the great apostle Paul, you will see how he recognized the places that God wanted him to go, and rightly so positioned himself for the opportunity that God will bring there. Jesus said that when you go preaching and you get into a place and they did not welcome you, he said you should just dust your feet now and move on because maybe that place is not meant for you. Every minister must understand the concept of positioning. Yeah. That you can position in a way that blocks you or your view of opportunity and also blocked opportunity from locating you. Yeah. Position is an organized system for finding a window in the mind of your prospect. That's for business people. When business people talk about positioning, they're talking about an organized system by which you can find a window in the mind of your prospect. The way we understand it as kingdom people, according to the scriptures, is that certain things will only occur at the right time, at the right place, under the right circumstances. That's how we understand it. Yeah. <laughs> Some things will only occur at the right time, at the right place, under the right circumstances. All through the scriptures, you realize that the only person, perhaps, maybe at my last check, I need to check more, but the only person that enjoyed unsolicited divine visitation or physical appearance of Jesus in his house was Zacchaeus. That did not ask him, Master, come to my house. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. Luke chapter 19, when you read from verse 1 to 5. Today, I'm going to be in your house. He did not invite Jesus. All Jesus saw was his effort at positioning. <laughs> All he saw was his effort at positioning. Trying to put himself in a place 
where he will be able to see Jesus and Jesus will be able to see him. <laughs> because when you look from, read from Luke 19 from verse 1, the Bible says, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. A chief tax collector. He was rich and he sought to see who Jesus was but could not because of the crowd for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, uh, uh, and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay in your house. Yeah. Every other person that Jesus visited, Jairus came crying on the neck of the master. Yeah. You can go on and on. M Mary and Martha, Jesus didn't happen on them. They invited him for lunch or dinner in their house. Do you remember the story? Yeah. All kinds of stories of people that Jesus visited. But in this case, this guy did not even have a choice. He said, make case and come down. I'm coming to your house today. Yeah. I'm coming to your house today. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> where was it? I was preaching somewhere where the Holy Spirit just gave me this understanding. That you know that one of the things that Jesus must have seen there was this guy's capacity to be flexible. Rich men don't climb trees. They pay people to climb. Yeah. Zacchaeus was a rich man. He was a chief tax collector. Permit me to say it like this. You know, if Zacchaeus was a Nigerian, his pot belly would be like this. You know, he had collected a gunje. You know, all kinds of bribe over the years. He was a rich guy. Imagine Zacchaeus as, as an African, an African rich man. He said, eh, <laughs> he said Pastor Godman is coming, or Pastor Dilly is coming. <laughs> you know, Reverend Jesus is in the neighborhood saying, eh, okay, um, can you, <laughs> well, in this current day, we say, uh, can you get his bank account? Let's send him a lot. Let me, let him, so that he, he will know that there's a rich man around here, or something like that. Or they will pack things and say, oh, that's even if he wanted to see Jesus. What he will be looking at is, let's see how we can sway him with some gift or something like that. But this rich man put some effort into it. Yeah. The Bible says he ran. He ran ahead. And then he climbed a tree, positioned himself. Jesus will not just walk by and see all that. This is a rich man. Went through all this effort. What effort are you putting? in the fulfillment of the dreams that God has put in your heart. You know, to, for you to be able to say, look, uh, uh, I, want, I want Jesus to see the effort I'm putting into this. Uh, you know, there's some people that will say, uh, God, God put this in my heart. I'm going to be the pastor of the largest church in Africa. And you have not been to the biggest auditorium in Lagos to see it. <laughs> uh, 2019, before the pandemic and even early last year, uh, that, you know, that redemption, uh, one kilometer, one and a half kilometer, I went there twice just to see, just walk around with some friends. Just, we're just looking at using eyes to snap. <laughs> you know, it's not only your camera phone that you use to snap. You can use your eyes to snap something. When you blink, you have snapped something. Yeah. And it registers inside there. Yeah. Because whatever enters your heart has entered your life. Yeah. Especially if the Holy Ghost is in your heart. <laughs> I hope you are still with me today. Yeah. People say, people dream all kinds of dreams. What, what, what level are you willing to go to understand your dream, to come into alignment with God, and to see your dream come to pass? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Because some people, even this M3 summit, maybe they even said they will attend, but all of a sudden, something happened. It's not priority again. Or they forgot. Yeah. They, all kinds of things. You know, some things just have to be important. There's some effort that needs to get into something that even God will know this guy is ready. Yeah, this person is ready. This person is ready. This person is ready. And we must never misappropriate prayer to think that after we have prayed, we don't have to do anything again. Yeah. Because this guy is just exemplify what we're talking about. So, 
One big question you should ask yourself today is, what is my sycamore tree? Yeah. What is my sycamore tree? What is, what is that thing that I need? Where is that positioning? What's that thing that I need to climb? What will position me to the point where I won't have a choice? God will just visit. There will be unsolicited divine visitation. Yeah. The lines will just fall onto me in pleasant places. Everybody will know that God is the one doing this. You know, there's some moves in ministry that will happen to you and nobody can second guess that God is at work in your life. Everybody knows the hand of God is upon your life. Those things don't just happen by mistake. They don't just happen anyhow. They come from a lot of effort at capacity development. That's how, that's how they come. Glory be to Jesus. So, where I started from is I said, as an important prayer, give me capacity for my opportunity. Then I'm asking this question again to add to it, which can turn to somebody's prayer also. What is my sycamore tree? Yeah. Yeah. What is, what is that thing that I need to climb on? This, for somebody, I've said it before, your sycamore tree is just digital technology. Just don't be technophobic. You know, that you're afraid of technology because God wants you there. Yeah. And you have to try something at the level where you are. Don't try to do 24 videos in two days like Pastor Dele. <laughs> there are levels. So start where you are. <laughs> yeah. Do five minutes video and put it on Instagram or Facebook. Make sure it's very sharp, it's great, and it blesses somebody. Yeah. Very soon, somebody will invite you to speak at their birthday party. <laughs> That's where it starts from. Yeah. Very soon. You know, just like that. That's how it starts from. And for somebody, it's not birthday party because your level, I mean, you imagine the story. I don't know if you have heard the story of Bishop T.D. Jakes before. How his big breakthrough came in ministry. Yeah. It was the late Paul Crouch that invited him to TBN to speak. Yeah. And somebody saw that and was like, this guy, <laughs> this guy is ready. We're going to blow this guy up. Yeah. I, I, I think I read one of his books. And before you know it, boom. West Virginia could not hold him again. Yeah. He had to move to Dallas. And the rest, like I say, is history. Now a global phenomenon. Yeah. There's a, there, there's a platform. There's a sycamore tree that God is preparing for someone. Let me wrap this all together. Four important capacities every minister must build. Or every minister must develop. Four important capacities every minister must develop. One is capacity for visioning. Capacity for visioning. You know, the popular scripture, Proverbs, 18 and 20, uh, 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 Proverbs 29 and 18, where there's no vision, the people will perish. Where there's no vision, the people cast off restraints. Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, from verse 1, I will stand upon my word, set me upon the rampart, and I will, uh, I will see what you will say unto me when I'm reproved. And he said, write a vision, make it plain upon the table, that it may run that reads it. He said, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it shall not tarry, it shall surely come. You know, all, all that, we're ministers, we know all that. But I don't want to just read our scriptures for you on vision. Let's talk practically about vision. Yeah, let's talk practically about vision. There's a need for you and I as ministers to develop capacity for visioning. Yeah, capacity for visioning. It's extremely, extremely important. The capacity to see things not the way they are, but the way they can be. Yeah. The capacity to see things, not the way they are, but the way they can be. The capacity to benchmark. I'm going to get into that in a bit. To benchmark. To be able to say, look, how do we move from here to there? Because there is already possible, and we're seeing it. Yeah. Capacity to, you know, a vision is a picture of the future that produces passion in you. COVID has stolen many people's passion. Yeah. Lockdown, shutdown, you know, social distancing, all the buzzword for this season uh, has caused some people's passion for ministry to dissipate. Especially if you're in the urban centers where we've had the, the greatest effect. Yeah. 
and all the constraints and all that. You can imagine people who used to do crusades, got a lot of crowd. You can't do that. You know, uh, music ministers, uh, concerts, different things. Now you, all the concerts are in studios, and then you, you can just imagine all the people where they shall watch it, you know, and all, that, all those kind of things. Many areas of ministry, the people have become discouraged and they are not able to translate it to say what is the current relevance of what I've been doing. You understand what I'm saying? Ladies and gentlemen, we need to come to terms with the fact that that mental picture of the future that produces passion in you, the devil is after it and he wants to steal it. Yes. Yeah. And every minister must develop capacity for visioning. Yeah. Seeing what God is doing in the midst of the confusion and crisis. Yeah. And being able to say, raise another prayer. <laughs> Lord, whatever you are doing in this season, don't do it without me. Yeah. Don't do it without me. Whatever you are doing in this season, don't do it without me. I want to be a partaker of anything that you are doing. I may not understand it, but I want to be inside it. Yeah. Because when I get inside it, I will understand it. Rather than becoming an onlooker, a spectator, every minister must be able to say, it may not be clear to me, but I want to be inside it. Yeah. I want to be inside it. That's how a man of vision behaves. Yeah. Lord, whatever you are doing in this season, don't do it without me. Don't do it without me. Add that to prayer point number three. <laughs> yeah. Whatever you are doing in this season, don't do it without me. Don't do it without me. That's, that should be the mantra of every minister right now. You may not understand everything that's going on, but God must see it in your heart. That your heart is still burning with passion for kingdom expansion. Yeah. Uh, that you, you, you still have a mental picture of the future that, that, that you know, fuels passion in you. Every minister must develop capacity for visioning. Yeah. And also, in addition to that, I'm still on that one point, I'm doing four, and I'll round off on that. Every minister, especially pastors and ministry leader, your capacity to communicate vision must move to a new level this season. In the midst of crisis, they said you cannot over-communicate. Communicate, communicate, communicate. One of the first things that was issued out to every CEO at the beginning of the pandemic is over-communicate. Yeah. To all stakeholders, from customer to staff to board members to everybody, communicate, communicate, communicate. Nobody wants to be in the dark. And one of the things that we're weak at in church is that capacity to communicate vision so that every attempt of the devil to steal that mental picture from the heart of members, of, of volunteers, of church leaders, we are able to come against it by over-communicating the vision even in the midst of crisis. Are you still with me today? Yeah. And, and maybe I should explain this to someone with this. In Matthew chapter 4, when you read from verse 18, Matthew 4 and verse 18, it's a very interesting scripture that the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to uh, uh, a long time ago. When we talk about how Jesus called the 12 disciples, a lot of the time we look at it as power in display, but we don't understand the other side of it. So Matthew chapter 4, when you read from verse 18, and Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee. The sea of Galilee was the high street of that day. Yeah, that was where the mainstay of the economy of Galilee was fishing. So Jesus went to the people who were engaging in fishing at high level. Peter was older than Jesus, so he was not a small boy. Andrew's brother, maybe maybe older, or about Jesus' age, I don't know. So he called people across demographics. The older he left there, he went to James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who would probably be like 18, 19, 21. Can I buttress my point? Somebody may be saying, how do you know that? They were still working with their father. One. Two, when it was time to pay taxes, only Jesus and Peter were old enough to pay taxes amongst his team. In Israel of those days, you have to be like 30 to pay tax. Those guys were too young to pay tax. That's why Jesus said, it's for me and you now. Just go to the river. You remember that scripture? Right, so I'm just using that to buttress my point. He just had all these young people on his team. As a young minister, you need people across demographics to help you with your ministry. 
you have to develop capacity to communicate the vision. Don't spiritualize, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus did not put anointing oil on his tongue when he said that. Because that's the picture in the mind of most ministers. That is anointing. You pray! And just went on, go on the street. Pity, follow me. They say, yeah, sister, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Yeah. No, let, let, let's paint this picture. <laughs> you know, Jesus went to Zebedee and Sons Galilee Limited. And he got there. This was his thriving fishing business. This guy had two sons who he was looking at to take over that business. And one reverend came. But, and he was not ordained <laughs> to make the master worse. <laughs> he was not ordained. Nobody did he ordain in any synagogue. Yeah. He was not wearing long rope like the Pharisees who look believable. Jesus was probably in, you know, in jeans and polo shirt. And just walked up to, you know, Zebedee and Sons, Nigeria Limited, or Galilee Limited, sorry. <laughs> and said, guys, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. If you were Zebedee, would you call the police? <laughs> Especially in these days where kidnapping has become rampant. Yeah? Because that's what most ministers just think. It was a display of power. It was beyond power. Jesus embodied the vision. What he said and was written in a code there, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, was not as simple as that. It meant something to Zebedee, pity, to the end that Zebedee did not stop his sons. Whatever Jesus said to them meant something to their father that these boys will fare better and live a more fulfilled life following this guy than staying in this business with me. So their father aborted his plans for them and allowed them to follow Jesus because he cast a vision in the presence of their father. Pastors, develop your capacity for visioning and communicating your vision. If we wake you up in the morning and ask you, what is the whole essence of this your ministry calling? What will you say? Yeah, how will you communicate it? A few years ago, I had um, um, one of our pastors, one of my senior associates, was going to leave a banking job. It was an AGM in a bank to join the ministry. And um, we had to do a lot of vision casting and talk and all that. But you see, the, the most uh, interesting one for me was when his dad called me. <laughs> I, it, it, the flash of my mind was Zebedee. Yeah. <laughs> Because his dad actually called me. I said, hey, Pastor Goldman, I heard, you know, my son spoke to me about uh, the, the talk that you people are having about him leaving his job with a, an international bank uh, to, you know. And, you know, it was just like, can you just help me to understand it? That kind of thing. Help me to understand it. And I had to talk. I had to talk about what we're doing. I had to talk about uh, what the future portends. I had to talk about the call of God on our lives. I had to talk about the fact that this is not about me. This is beyond me. And it's not going to be about him also. This, this, there's something bigger than all of us. Yeah. And whatever I said, God helped me. But the man, I mean, came into full-time ministry. <laughs> So many people talk about different things. Oh, uh, PG, how do we get people to commit and serve? How do I get people to help me with this new ministry? How do I get people to help me with this faith-based, you know, not-for-profit? Whatever it is, your power, I mean, your capacity to communicate uh, is what uh, plus the, the, the power of God upon you or the prayer fire that you put upon it all working together is what melts the heart of people, paints a picture in their heart that the, the, the devil cannot steal, and then that passion is ignited in them also. But truth is that God wants you to God wants to see you embody the vision, then communicate the vision, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or you are casting the vision publicly. In our church, we make sure that periodically, in the course of a year, I mean, two weeks ago, I did the first vision casting for this year. Talked about all the things we're going to do, you know, and all that, and why people must commit. Both their time and their resources. Because the assignment of the king is urgent. Yeah. 
You do it consistently. There are people you have to sit with one-on-one, -on -one, major stakeholders, to help them brush their sense of vision again. But if the vision in your own heart is leaking, you won't be able to do that. Yeah. Glory be to Jesus. For somebody that this is important to, let me add one more scripture and I will move to my next point because my time is almost gone. Nehemiah chapter 2, when you read from verse 17 to 20, Nehemiah cast a vision, compelling. One of the things you learn from the life of Nehemiah is capacity to cast a compelling vision. This was a man that lived 4, 444 BC before Christ. Yeah, 444 BC. That was when Nehemiah built the wall of Jerusalem. He, 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 this guy cast a compelling vision. Nehemiah chapter 2 from verse 17. He said, then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lies in waste and its gates are born with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of God, of my God, which has been good upon me. Look at that. This guy was saying, look, <laughs> this is what I told them. Uh, he described the situation, then he it, 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 it described the hand of God upon his life. What a way to cast a vision. Because some people will, will say, this is what we're going to do. But you cannot say, look, the hand of God is upon me. I have this grace for this, for that, for that. You must know what you are graced for. And you must be willing to communicate it without an apology. Yeah, because faithful is he that sent you and that called you, and he will also do it. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Said, I told them of the hand of my God that was upon me, the good hand of God that was upon me, and also the king's words that has, uh, had been spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Said, then they set their hands uh, to this good work. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Somebody will cast a vision like that. You can't be talking like that even in the midst of crisis and people, you will still have a remnant. People that will wake up and say, that vision must be fulfilled. Yes. Praise God, somebody. Very, very important. Secondly, capacity for strong and purposeful relationships. I said capacity for vision, then capacity for strong and purposeful relationships. Circle of influence, of friendship, of accountability partners. At Exponential, I'm going to be, one of the things I'm speaking about at Exponential is the lonely leader, the Elijah syndrome. We have many people today who have uh, strong spiritual capacity, but very weak socially. Yeah. Social capital is zero. The only thing you have to show for your calling is anointing. <laughs> It's not a good place to be. Yeah, it's not a good place to be. Especially with the example that we saw in the, in the scriptures, in, in, in Elijah. If you want the full message, you, you watch it on Exponential. Yeah. It's not a good place to be. Because even God had to cut down his ministry abruptly. Yeah. You have to have enough you know, social capital. Capacity for strong, purposeful relationships. And accountability partners. Uh, uh, Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9 down to 12. Uh, uh, the Bible says two are better than one for they have a good reward uh, uh, for, 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 for their labor. Two are better than one for they can uh, New Living Translation says for they can help each other succeed. I love that. Two are better than one for they can help each other succeed. If one, one person falls, the other one will reach out to help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. That's New Living Translation. Someone who falls alone is in real trouble. <laughs> uh, ministers, you, you, you can't afford to be in trouble this season. The whole world is already in trouble. We don't need you in trouble. Yeah. You need to be like that guy who has four friends that could carry him to Jesus. The least that you need at this time is four great people around you. Your spouse being one of them if you're married. And not being married is not an excuse to be a loner. Because God, the Bible says uh, in the book of Psalms, I think Psalm 68 or so, he said, it's the one that put the, the lonelies, uh, the, 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 the solitaries in family. One translation said, it sets the lonelies in families. Yeah. It's for us to embrace it. 
you know, to embrace it. I love Psalm 133 when you read from verse 1 to 3 in the New Living Translation also. It said, how wonderful, how pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. Message tra- Bible Translation says, how beautiful, how wonderful when brothers and sisters get along. And you see, the writer of Psalm 133 was David. David, who had seen all kinds of disloyalty, uh, Saul was against him, adversary of his soul, all kinds of things. Even in this his submission in Psalm 133, he still said, how beautiful, how wonderful. You know, when you have suffered all kinds of pain from human beings, and in your contemplation, you can still write Psalm 133, you are a great man. It means you are saying, my strength notwithstanding, the word of God cannot be broken. Yeah, that's what it means. <laughs> and many ministers are listening to me right now. You may have suffered all kinds of things in recent past. Church splits, different things, people call you names. It does not mean that you should separate yourself. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you should separate yourself. Develop capacity for divine connections. For the right people around you. I have somebody still with me today. The right people. Put in the right people around you. It's very, very important. Especially great friendships. Great network within the, the kingdom. It's very important. Number three, because of time, develop capacity to lead. To lead. Capacity to lead. Yeah. The capacity to lead. It's very important. Develop the capacity to lead. Proverbs chapter 6, when you read from verse 6, if we start with self-leadership, he said, go to the hands, you slow God. Consider our ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler. Yeah, he has none of those. Provides herself, uh, 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 as supplies in summer, and gathers her food in harvest. And he said, how long will you slumber, O slow God? When will you rise up from the sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to sleep. He said, so shall your poverty come uh, to you like prowler. And your need like harmed men. There's a need for each and every one of us to develop the capacity for leadership, to lead. And it starts with self-leadership. It starts with self-leadership. That's where it starts from. It starts with self-leadership. God wants you and I to develop capacity to lead. To lead. And it starts with leading yourself. And leading yourself also means you need to believe in the gifts and the calling of God on your life. I said it before, but I just want to mention one or two things in that area. Your gifts matter and your calling is needed for this season. Yeah, your calling is needed for this season. You know, in, in, in the midst of crisis, what I've realized is that many ministers have come to a point where they feel not needed. They feel that they're not needed because some people are just shining. You know, you can be intimidated when you see what some people are doing in the midst of crisis. <laughs> yeah. And you're just like, ah, let's just leave it for them. <laughs> They're the people that God called. You know, maybe we'll receive the call on their behalf, so let's just leave it for them. No. No. God called you too. God called you too. Yeah. God called you too. And you have to, to be able to speak like the Apostle Paul did in Romans 11 and verse 13. said, for, for I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. Yeah. You have to magnify your own ministry and magnify your own office. Yeah. You have to. You have to. Paul writing again, he said there are diversities of gift but the same spirit. There are differences of administration uh, uh, but, but the same Lord. Said so that the diversity of activities, but it is the same God uh, who works all in all, and said, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each for the profit of all. So you have something, and you must believe that you have something. You must believe that you have something. Don't be intimidated by any other person's gift. Shine your light. Uh, let your, your own gift come to life this season. Uh, develop capacity to lead yourself out of anything that wants to hold you down. So it's time to focus on your calling and, and, you know, and, and, and just benchmark the right mentors. That's part of leadership. Some people just refuse to put themselves with the right mentors that will help them to see further. Because when you climb on the shoulders of great men, you see further. And it's part of submitting yourself for leadership. You know, I said that with self-leadership, but also submitting yourself for leadership. 
mentoring, you know, should not lead to failure to thrive syndrome. Can I say that one more time? Mentoring should not lead to failure to thrive syndrome. It is for benchmarking and inspiration. Can I explain that? And I'll take my last point. Mentoring should not lead to failure to thrive syndrome. Some people want to engage in mentoring relationship where your mentor, like Jesus, eh, will almost die on the cross for you. You know, mentor is doing everything. Mentor is doing everything. Mentor must teach you this. Mentor must bail you out here. Mentor must do this for you. Mentor must tell you what to do. <laughs> no, no, no. We have only one Messiah. His name is Jesus. Your mentor is not your Messiah. There are two different things. Yeah, there are two different things. Your mentor did not die on the cross for you. <laughs> so don't crucify your mentor. <laughs> That's what leads to failure to thrive syndrome. What is failure to thrive syndrome? When, for instance, it's time for a child to walk and the child cannot walk. That's why they said in the story of the eagle, the eagle will take the eaglet and drop it at high altitude so that it can flap. Yeah. That's what mentors should do to us. Help us to be able to flap because when you don't flap those wings at the right time, they become weak and flabby. That is failure to thrive syndrome. So when it's time to thrive, you, you, the person will not be able to thrive. And because you are not leading yourself and submitting yourself, for instruction and tutelage, and then deriving inspiration from the mentors, benchmarking that if God can help these people to be like this, uh, every generation must be an improvement of the previous. It may not be on the same trajectory, maybe on a different trajectory, but we're going to make stronger progress. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Very, very important. Lastly today, develop capacity to hear from God. Yeah. Develop capacity to hear from God. You know, my pastor, Pastor Samadhi Emi, is a great uh, success teacher. And I remember back in the day when all this message of success and all that leadership started, when you ask him, what is the number one key to success? The first thing he will say, especially if you're a Christian, is hearing from God and obeying his voice. Yeah. That's the number one key. Every other thing is an addition. Hearing from God and obeying his voice. When I was coming here this morning, I was looking for that book, Following God's Plan for Your Life, by Kennedy Hagin. I think I still have three copies. And I'm not going to dash anybody. Because I position those three copies in different places. There's one that is in my bag, my retreat bag, so that every time I'm going on a periodic retreat, I have it there. Yeah. Because as a young minister, I read that book and I got hooked on it. And I said, this is a manual for my life. Yeah. So, the, like I said, the last two or three copies that I have, nobody should inbox me to say, hey, Pastor, send me one. No, no, no. You go and look for your own. Yeah. It's important to me. That's why I have more than one copy. It's not because I want to dash anybody. You need to understand how God speaks to you, how God gives you direction. You know, this dawned on me, Pastor Dele, about, yeah, I think it's about 30 years ago now. It must be 1991 or 1992. Then we were at Rema Chapel, Yaba. Pastor Sam was just posted to Lagos to Pastor Rema Chapel. 91, end of, yeah, 91. And this was Casino Cinema. So this must have been maybe early 92, though. We were there. There was an issue in town, an unrest. A pastor, one, one of the senior pastors in the ministry then, uh, Rema uh, Chapel, was, was coming to Lagos from outside of Lagos. I don't know whether it was Ibadan or Gumosho or Ilorin. And we just finished intercessory meeting. I was in intercessory department. I was in prayer department. We just finished meeting and we're coming out and we saw this man and he said, ah, that the kind of suffering I suffered today. You know, for a pastor to be saying that a first of church member is not good, but <laughs> he has suffered, so he had to say it. That he had trek from maybe Ojodu Bega if you know Lagos very well, for those of you outside of Lagos, that's in the aspect of Lagos, in the suburbs of Lagos, entering Lagos. He trekked from there to Yaba in the heart of the mainland Lagos. Because Lagos was more like on the kind of lockdown that was an unrest that particular day. Pastor, you know what happened? I stood there. I was, I was young. You can imagine 30 years ago. I stood there. I was a teenager. I stood there and I heard that. And in my heart, I said, ah, ah. But this man is a man of God now. Couldn't he have heard God that something was happening in Lagos? How did he just come to Lagos and then suffer 
and walk like that. And the thing just stayed with me. Yeah, it just stayed with me. That it's possible to be led by the Spirit. It's possible to be able to catch a glimpse of some things ahead and allow God to order your steps in life and in ministry. That was where, I, when I got following God's plan for you, I said this one. <laughs> you know? And, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you need to develop capacity. You need to find your own book. I just mentioned my own. And there are many others. You need to develop capacity to be able to hear as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Those are the sons of God. Yeah. You cannot be a minister and we cannot say you are a son of God. Yeah. Because you need capacity to hear God. Time will not permit me, but I can tell you specifics. I remember when God, when, when I was about to transition from Daystar, and God told me that we should start out from the highland. Can I tell you the truth? I've said it before. I was intimidated. Yeah. I did not think I would be able to successfully pastor a church on the island. All that was coming to my mind were all the big, big churches there as at the time. This was just uh, um, 11, going to 12 years ago now when I was still thinking about this. And I took my time to pray. And I remember where I was. Yeah. I was reading the scriptures. And I was reading Genesis. And this thing kept coming to me. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Eastward in Eden. Eastward in Eden. And it could not leave my mind. I said, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? Eh. He said, God was even specific about where he planted his own garden. It was eastward in Eden. Yeah. And he said, we said you should go to east of Lagos. And you're arguing. <laughs> yeah. And I, had, I went to check it. I just went to meet my pastor. I said, eh, it is island. Do I... I, I really don't want to go, but that's where God is saying. He said it's okay. <laughs> the rest that they say is history. Yeah. We started us on Lagos, Lagos Island. When we moved to the appropriate place, which is like in that lucky area, it was as if they were waiting for us. But I knew where I was when I heard it. That's why I said, if you are an apple, don't try to be planted in Oshodi. Apples don't grow there. Yeah, that's a specific place. The right place, the right time, and things just, you know, things just have a way. Like, like I said, I can go on and on, whether it's about pioneering, because as, as an apostolic person, you keep pioneering. And for every pioneering effort, you need God to speak to you. Yeah, you need God to, and you have to develop capacity to hear God. And you know why I'm emphasizing this, and this is based on my own personal experience also, in the midst of crisis, sometimes we wing it. Yeah, we wing it. Yeah, we wing it. That, that things that you want to do, and you just say, oh, everywhere is not settled. That's what I feel. Let me just, uh, maybe we, we should spend time to hear from God. Mm -mm. Let, let's just go ahead. Yeah, I found myself in that place once or twice, and it didn't, it didn't go well. Yeah. You have to know that this is ministry. We don't wing it in ministry. Yeah. They call her must be calling and you must hear the call and you must understand the divine direction and follow it and you need to develop that capacity because nobody can develop the capacity for you you can imagine how uh, the, the great apostle paul could have died if he did not have the capacity to hear from god in many situations i will not permit in many situations is it that voyage to rome that if he didn't have the capacity to hear from God, that nobody would die on this. This ship will be wrecked, but nobody will die here. If not, they would have killed him with the, with the other uh, prisoners. Yeah, because he said, let's just waste all of them. Yeah. Maybe they are prisoners anyway. Let's waste them and let's save this. But he was hearing from God. My God will protect your life. He will protect your ministry. You will weather the storms ahead. You will come out stronger. I pray today that God will give you capacity for your opportunities. In the name of the Lord Jesus, it will open your eyes to see your sycamore tree. In the name of the Lord Jesus, and I also pray for somebody, join to this M3 summit, that whatever God is doing in this season, he will not do it without you. He will order your steps to be at the right place at the right time. In the name of the Lord Jesus, the fire of the Holy Ghost will not be quenched in your heart. Your passion will not run dry. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus, the oil of God upon your life will not evaporate. This season, my God will work everything out for your good and land you at the right spot for the fulfillment of your ministry in Jesus' precious name. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Wow.